Hey everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove here today with another Omnibus review and today I'm going to be taking a look at the third volume collecting classic Avengers material. This is the Avengers Omnibus Volume 3. Previously on the channel I have already taken a look at Volumes 1 and 2. So we're going to move on today and look at this third volume collecting that stuff and just see the next chunk of classic Silver Age Avengers. So this book I think like all four volumes I believe of the classic Avengers stuff um, the Omnibus Editions, I think they're all out of print at the moment, which is pretty annoying and surprising, honestly, that there haven't been multiple printings of any of those books. I think they've all only had one printing each so far. Really strange, considering how big a franchise The Avengers is these days. But um, next year will be the 60th anniversary of The Avengers, so perhaps there are reprint announcements to come. We shall see, of course. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to showcase this book off for anybody who might be interested in it. Maybe help you put it on your radar if it's one you don't have, but are considering maybe getting at some point. Perhaps you can track it down and find a copy of it even now, I don't know. Um, but let's take a look at it then. So this is the standard variant cover. Um, the, there was a DM variant cover, I believe. Uh, I think it was the cover to issue 80 by John Buscema. But this is pretty cool. It's by, I think, uh, Alan Davis, Mark Farmer and Laura Martin. Um, it's okay, it's not one of the best images, but uh, it's pretty cool, I think. That showcases a lot of the uh, different members of the team quite nicely, so I've got no problems with it. Uh, the spine, you know, if this was to be reprinted, you can be sure that that's the one thing that absolutely would change. They'd likely shrink that spine image down so it's like that, and then you'd probably get a little image down here across the bottom. That's the new format seems to be these days that they're sticking with, for better or worse. Um, but anyway, Minor issue, really. The back of the book, then we get the cover gallery showcasing the different issues involved. And uh, what we're basically getting here is uh, Avengers issues 59 to 88, an issue of Incredible Hulk 140, and a little excerpt, I think, featuring the Black Knight from Marvel Super Heroes 17. So, a good chunk of stuff here, really just moving us nicely through to really the end of the Silver Age era of Avengers. By the time we get to volume four, really moving into the uh, the Bronze Age era of the, uh, the series by that point. Um, the hardcover itself, got that kind of classic um, plain design that previously a lot of the Silver Age books tended to have. So you just got the title on the front, identical spine, plain on the back. Now when they reprint these books, they tend to put something on the back as well, like a, a symbol or an image of the characters featuring inside. It just makes it a little bit more interesting. But uh, again, not a huge, a huge change really. Um, so let's take a look through the book. So this is continuing Roy Thomas's run as writer on Avengers. He actually had a pretty long run on this series, you know, when he took over from Stan Lee. He wrote it from issues, I think it's about issue, <laughs> testing my own memory now, I think issue 36 to uh, issue 104, something like that. Anyway, a good chunk of issues. But um, yeah, so primarily we're seeing artwork in here by the Buscema brothers, John and Sal. Um, they kind of take it in turns a little bit. So John starts off doing a few. Um, Sal does a chunk of issues, then John comes back. But a few other artists appearing in between. So we get three issues, which are really cool, by Gene Colan. A couple by Barry Windsor Smith, who's just going by the name Barry Smith at this point. And then, uh, you know, Frank Giacoya, even, who was primarily, primarily an inker, but did a couple of guest penciler issues in here as well. Um, yeah, so let's take a look. So we get the contents page here then. So... Always like to see this, and we're moving into the early 70s at this point, so arguably even this book is going into the Bronze Age, depending on where you personally like to uh, define your different eras of comics as starting and ending. I think probably about 1970 is where I would generally say the Bronze Age begins. So yeah, this is kind of transitioning from Silver to Bronze Age. Um, you get a few of these essay introductions here by Roy Thomas. I think there are three in total in the book. These were previously printed in Marvel Masterworks collections, which collected this material in smaller chunks. They are reused here, obviously still applicable, and really interesting to read. Roy Thomas is, I think, just a really insightful writer when it comes to um, telling these behind-the-scenes stories that he gives in these introductions, giving you a lot of context and trivia even, you know, pointing stuff out that you probably would have not really noticed if you didn't read him writing about it. Little instances of slight edits to artwork and things like that. Really interesting. I, I think I learn something every time I read one of his introductions, honestly. I just think he's a, a true comics historian. The guy loves comics, knows pretty much everything about comics, it seems. 
So those are always a worthwhile read, in my opinion. Definitely recommend you check those out whenever you come across them. Um, so we start the book off here, though, with a couple of interesting issues. Um, I suppose I should give a spoiler warning here, actually, before I dive in any further, because um, I will just talk about a couple of things that happen in the stories, but for the most part, I'm just going to give a, a bit of an overview as I look through the book and showcase it, help give you an idea maybe of what it's like. Um, but yeah, spoiler warning for some things, I guess. Um, but yeah, so in initially we see the introduction of this character, Yellow Jacket, who kind of shows a fascination with the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne. And initially you don't know who he is. It's, uh, it's kind of strange. He comes out of nowhere, but suddenly the Wasp declares kind of dramatically on this final page that she's going to marry him. And all the other Avengers are kind of thinking, you know, what? This guy just showed up. We don't know who he is. Why are you marrying him? And then in the next issue, the wedding is going ahead. It's a really kind of weird story. They actually do get married. With it being a Marvel superhero wedding, naturally there are some gate crashes. We see the uh, ringmaster and his circus of crime, classic Silver Age villains, um, turn up and try and spoil the fun. There's a fight, and it turns out in the end that Yellow Jacket is um, Hank Pym, aka Ant-Man slash Giant-Man slash Goliath. Um, interesting story where it's revealed that he kind of had a bit of amnesia or something, took on the persona of Yellow Jacket. Uh, the Wasp knew it was him, she recognised him when nobody else did, so that's why she agreed to marry him. Really a strange start to that marriage, and considering how that relationship ended up going over the years, pretty rocky relationship between Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne. I suppose it's only suitable that they had a weird start to it. Um, but I want to point out this issue, the beginning of this one, issue 61. I just love these opening splash pages that deliver the title in this excellent way. Uh, this is featuring Surta and Ymir, characters from Norse mythology and borrowed from Thor comics here. But I just love this. Some say the world will end in fire. Flick the page. Some say in ice. Really cool. Um, John Buscema just nailing it there with some classic splash pages. And um, there's a few instances actually in this book of uh, title pages like that delivered in really cool ways. Um, featuring within the artwork. I like it. Um, this also features a very different looking Doctor Strange we see here in this costume and mask. This was during a time where Roy Thomas was also writing Doctor Strange and that series wasn't doing particularly well so they tried a few things to try and reinvigorate reader interest including one of those things being giving him a new costume and mask to make him look, look more like a superhero. Didn't really work because that series ended up getting cancelled anyway but interesting to see these things when you read through and you know See these little changes throughout comics history? At this point, they changed the title to series as well, so it became The Mighty Avengers. Changed from just Avengers to Mighty Avengers. Change of font style and all that. Didn't last very long, about eight issues, I think, before it went back to just being The Avengers. Another cool title page here by John Buscema. Um, this is a pretty cool uh, story. This is, uh, goes back to Wakanda. Black Panther is on the Avengers team at this point. He's one of the main lineup. Um, and they go back to Wakanda here. Because there's some trouble brewing in his homeland. This guy, using the alias of the Manape, basically wants the throne for himself. So a big fight ensues. Classic action sequence drawn again by John Buscema. Just a great artist. You know, I've praised his work so much in the previous volume where he came onto this series and made an immediate impact on it. Just helped elevate the Avengers to another level. Um, yeah, can't really say enough good things about him, as is either his work on this series or in general. But um there was a point here with issues 63 to 65 where John Buscema was just being kept too busy working on the Silver Surfer series with Stan Lee. So we've got Gene Colan who came onto this book for three issues. And uh, another great artist, another one of my favourites I think really, Gene Colan, just did some beautiful work. I don't necessarily think that this work on Avengers in these three issues is his best work, but there's some really nice artwork here and hopefully you, uh, you'll agree. <laughs> Let me know anyway if you do or don't. Um, but I think it's cool. It's not really the best artwork in this book. It's not the best work of Colin's, but it's definitely some cool stuff in here. Another instance here, though, uh, where we get a dramatic splash page reveal. Double page spread this time, and that's just stunning. Love it. Full credit to Gene Colin there and uh, George Klein as Inca. Um, yeah, so really this is... Uh, this is the era of Avengers, sort of starting in Volume 2 and then going through this book and, and Volume 4 ultimately as well. Uh, I really think that the 
stories start to get much more interesting here. And the team lineup, the character development really comes a long way with uh, Roy Thomas writing them all. I think he did a great job of developing the team. Um, it didn't get off to the greatest start in Volume 1 with the Stanley era. I don't think he fully realised the potential of this team. I think Roy Thomas did a lot of better uh, character work in developing each of them, giving them a better team dynamic, in my opinion, anyway. So when I did last read through this, another cool sequence of pages here, I love stuff like this, where they kind of do what was at the time really quite experimental stuff. You know, something like this doesn't necessarily look impressive in a modern comic, but back then, you know, that's pretty experimental. But anyway, yeah, I just think Roy Thomas really um, helped to make this series a lot more fun. And last time I was reading through it, by the time I was reading through the stuff in Volume 3, I was having a great time. But uh, it has been a while since I did read this stuff. So, you know, I will fully admit that I don't remember all the stories in complete detail. Um, but I certainly remember I had a lot of fun last time I checked it out. This uh, issue 67 here, we've got the second appearance, second full story arc featuring Ultron. Of course, a classic villain these days. Um, we also get the artwork, I think at this point, artworks by Barry Smith, who looks very Kirby-esque, in my opinion, at this point. You know, like his faces here, these are really kind of Kirby-esque faces. That could almost, if you told me Jack Kirby had drawn them, if I didn't know otherwise, I would believe you, I think, because it definitely looks like his work. Um, I think definitely the best artwork in here is still coming from John Buscema, as was the case, as was the case in Volume 2. But we start to see work by his brother Sal, who came on here, who, who did a, a, certainly a perfectly good job, you know? Um, I feel like Sal Bashem has always kind of, kind of lived in his brother's shadow a little bit, you know? Big John, one of those great artists, just right up there with some of the very best. Um, hard to kind of live up to that, I suppose. I don't think Sal is quite as good, but it would not be fair to dismiss him as simply an inferior artist to his brother because he's done a lot of great work, not least of all, of course, I think, what was it, a roughly 10-year run as a regular penciler on the Hulk through the 70s. That was really cool. You know, he did some great work on there. I think Sal Bashema's Hulk is um, one of the definitive looks of the Hulk that comes to my mind when I think of the character. And he did some good work on this series as well, uh, absolutely no doubt, you know. Um, this is a cool story. So we get Kang the Conqueror returning in here. Great double page spread there. And uh, will we soon be seeing Kang fully realised as a cool villain in the MCU? We will see. Um, okay, yeah, the Squadron Sinister. This is an interesting team. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, we've got Sal Bashema writing, uh, not writing, drawing these issues. And uh, this was an interesting idea by Roy Thomas to bring in this team of uh, villainous characters to be... Uh, opponents of the Avengers, but to base them on the Justice League. So each of these characters is kind of a rip-off of one of the Justice Leagues. So you've got Superman, Green Lantern, Batman. Can't remember which this one's supposed to be, the Flash, I guess. Um, but yeah, just kind of obvious rip-offs. Also get the introduction of the Grandmaster, first appearance by him. Um, a very different version of the character from the uh, Jeff Goldblum version in Thor Ragnarok, if that's the one that some people are maybe most familiar with. Uh, but no, this one is very much like a, a cool-headed strategist, you know, literally like a chess grandmaster, as that is what he was supposed to be. Um, but yeah, these characters are pretty interesting, these uh, Justice League ripoffs. In fact, they all become the Squadron Supreme, I think. These, these are the guys who form that team. I'm not really familiar with that team, to be honest. Not too familiar, anyway. Um, but yeah, always interesting, you know, I said it already. Interesting to see some of these origins of characters and... Some of these quirky, wacky things that have gone on at various points. And The Avengers was definitely a series that had a lot of cool ideas in it during this time. Um, I think this is where the Black Knight eventually comes onto the team. So, another change in lineup. People coming and going regularly. It's one of the key things that I like about The Avengers um, in general, I suppose. But during this time in particular, you know, from an early point, it was... Um, it was really one of the key parts of the series, one of the key components of what the Avengers were, that they had a bit of a change in lineup quite frequently. Really like this final pinup here, splash page slash pinup. And yeah, so it's just pretty cool, I think, to, to read through it. And when you get your different people joining the team, coming and going, it helps keep things fresh. 
another really cool double page spread. Some really good artwork throughout here in general by all the artists, I think, whether it's John, Sal, Gene Colan, Barry Smith. I think they all do a great job. Perhaps I'm a little bit biased just because I'm kind of a fan of the Silver Age slash Bronze Age style. Certainly this era, you know, when you're talking about late 60s into the 70s, I think that was a great time for comic artwork in general. You, get, you had artists just trying lots of different things, really experimenting. Really cool page here. I'm just kind of staring at that at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely interested to hear interested to hear in what your thoughts might be. If you've read this material before, um, are you interested in checking it out? I definitely need to reread it, that's for sure. You know, I, so often the case, I've probably said this dozens of times of different reviews I've done for books over the last, I don't know, year and a bit since I've been doing this channel. But um, yeah, so many times I've been looking through a book just like this and when it's been a while since I've read it, and most of the time, the main thing I'm thinking is, man, I really need to reread this, you know. It just looks so cool. Um, John Buscema back as the artist at this point, and Quicksilver ends up joining the team as well. I think it's one of those classic things where he starts off, they're kind of fighting him, they have to stop him, um, and he ends up signing up with the team properly. Coming back, I should say. He'd already been on the team earlier on, so... Him and Scarlet Witch, both, they'd been on the team and they'd left... Pretty sure this is where they come back. And also where Roy Thomas kind of dipped his toe a little bit into the sword and sorcery genre with the introduction of this guy, Archon, this kind of barbarian character. Um, kind of interesting because very shortly after this, um, Roy Thomas would of course start working on the Conan the Barbarian series, which is... Maybe besides this, the run that he's best known for. I mean, arguably, that is the run he is best known for. I think it's the run that he spent the most amount of time writing Conan, rather than, uh, you know, as opposed to any other series. I think he wrote more issues of that, of that than anything else. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of, I suppose, in a way, his first taste of writing a character from that kind of genre, the barbarian-type character, before Marvel fully went for it and launched that Conan series. Um, which, of course, also would ultimately feature in collaborating for a long time with John Buscema again. So, yeah, very cool. Um, but anyway, to keep on track with the Avengers, not get too sidetracked and talk about Conan all day, um, get the return here of the Man-Ape character, who we'd seen in an earlier issue in here. And this book actually ends up stopping just short, um, like immediately before, the famous Kree Skrull War storyline. So this goes up to issue 8, uh, 88 I mean, um, and that storyline starts with issue 89. So that's the first thing in volume 4, which I will be getting to very soon, because I want to kind of finish off this little Avengers run I've been doing of reviews. And uh, you know, some people let me know that they're interested in seeing these books, so hopefully this is useful slash interesting for, for any of you if you're watching it and you're one of those people who wanted to see it. Um, this, I think, was the DM cover, issue 80. Not really the best cover in the book or the most iconic story in here. Um, but it's pretty cool, I suppose, you know. It's John Buscema artwork, so you can't really go wrong with it. Really like this. Yes, of course... Um, the budding relationship between the Vision and Scarlet Witch kind of starts to show itself during this time. Not, they're not really in a full-blown relationship yet, but it starts to appear. You start to have these little scenes where Wanda is realizing that the Vision is quite emotionally complex and she has this kind of desire to get to know him better and, you know, all the usual kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. And issue here with Daredevil guest starring. Definitely recommend checking this up, uh, checking this out even, checking it up, checking it out. Um, yeah, so this is this is the first appearance of Valkyrie. I think it might be. You know, I don't think. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I do remember this story. Um, 
this is really cool. Another great double page spread. There's several in here, as I mentioned already, that you can just kind of stare at for a while, really take in the detail and, and enjoy it. Um, this Valkyrie, I think, is not really the Valkyrie. If I remember rightly, she turns out to be... Oh, I'm trying so hard to remember what this is. Does she turn out to be the Enchantress or something like that? And she's just tricking the female members of the Avengers into forming an all-female team to kind of turn against the men. Um, only for it to turn out she's not real. Yeah, she is the Enchantress. Genuinely want to give myself a pat on the back for remembering that because I haven't read this in years. Um, but then, funnily enough, that version of Valkyrie and that design that we see her having posed as does end up being made into a real character and uh, actually starring with the Defenders when that series launched around this time, that the same sort of time these comics were coming out, in fact, maybe just after this. So yeah, that was one of, that's one of the coolest stories in here though, I think. That one with the uh, fake Valkyrie, quite like that. And getting towards the end of the book here, we see Black Knight appearing again. I think he's on the team at this point. <laughs> We've got fake Batman. But yeah, just again to reiterate, really do recommend checking these uh, these comics out. If you ever get a chance to pick up these Avengers volumes, certainly if you're interested in this era of comics anyway, or of course the Avengers, then definitely, definitely uh, pick them up if you can. Oh yeah, the origin of T'Challa. Finally get to his origin revealed here in issue 87. Because um, all during this time, you know, at this point Black Panther had been around for a few years, since about... 1966, I think, when he was introduced in Fantastic Four. Um, but all through this time, he hadn't yet had his own series, I don't believe. I think that came a year or two after this, when he first had a, a series of his own. So he was just kind of showing up periodically as a guest character, or, of course, here for a while as a member of the Avengers team. So details about him and his world and Wakanda and everything, you know, it was being built up slowly through subplots, really. So this was the first time you see a proper origin for him. And here we've got the final issue, which I think this is what crosses over with the issue of Hulk, issue 140. Which is why that's thrown in at the back here to finish this story off. Yeah, and you get some uh, Herb Trimp artwork. Of course, he was another artist that spent a long time drawing the Hulk. We need more Hulk on the buses. I'll tell you that right now. We need, we need a volume two and three and onwards. Can't be stuck with just having volume one of that classic material. We need to see more of the Hulk because once you get into 1970s Hulk, that's so fun, you know, that's such a fun series. Not one of the best ever series, but a lot more fun than the 60s era of Hulk, I think. So definitely, we'd love to get a second and third volume and so on of Incredible Hulk. Continue that line. Um, so this is the final story in here. Marvel Superhero 17, a Black Knight story. Depending on how interested you are in the Black Knight as a character, this may or may not look appealing to you. Um, not really one of my favourite characters. You know, he's okay. He's alright. But then we get to the extras in the back. So what do we have? We've got some... Not Brandek. Yikes. Ugh. If you've been watching my videos for any length of time, chances are you know I hate that. Um, but then we get some extra covers and sketches. Sketches are always my favourite thing. Seeing original pencils or, you know, uninked covers or unused artwork, stuff like that. These are my favourite kind of things to see in the back and have a look through. Do let me know what you think about this book. Definitely interested in hearing opinions on this era of Avengers. I think it's a lot of fun. It's not one of my favourite um, story uh, series, I should say, from this time. I keep saying it probably <laughs> every time I re review one of these Silver Age slash Bronze Age books, but um, I always think Fantastic Four and Amazing Spider-Man are my two favourites from this overall era, but Avengers is definitely 
not too far behind. It's a lot of fun, especially when you get into the material in this third volume. Kind of partway through volume two, I think it gets really good. And that quality is consistent throughout everything in here as well. So a good book worth checking out and reading if you haven't had the chance. Um, but hopefully, yeah, that was in some way useful or insightful or interesting for you. Um, let me know again your thoughts on the book and I'll be back again soon with something else. Thanks for watching.